Okay, well, um, we prepared a small presentation about mapping merit in mindset, and then especially with the focus on the subtitle towards a shared methodology. Um, we'll, we'll briefly discuss how our research is related to merit in mindsets uh, and how we want to catch this mindset through mapping. Um, yeah, this is what we were going to present. And then we will end with the presentation with the results of the Google Forms, uh, the language of mapping, uh, and some questions that will hopefully, hopefully will invite you to a discussion. So I will start with mapping as a tool for research. Um, so it may be obvious for many of you, but for the sake of clarity, I will start by pointing out that mapping is a tool for doing research. Uh, among uh, historians, but also in other uh, spatial related scientists, uh, mapping is still unsophisticatedly uh, been seen as an added value to research. So that's, uh, that's why I want to use this quote uh, of Richard White, and I will um, read it. Uh, visualization and spatial history are not about producing illustrations or maps to communicate things that you have discovered by other means. It is a means of doing research. It's generated, it generates questions that might otherwise go unasked. It reveals historical relations that might otherwise go unnoticed. It under, undermines, it substantiates stories upon which we build our own version of the past. Um, so recently, Carola and I wrote two articles in which we state uh, that if we want to understand and uncover the maritime mindset, we need a research methodology for comparative spatial analysis for port city regions based on geospatial mapping. Um, the first article is already part, uh, published in Portus Plus, and some of you have already read it. And the second one will be published uh, soon in Urban Planning. In both of these articles, uh, we are, um, we're focusing on the long-term spatial development of port city regions from urbanization uh, to the present, and we argue that through geospatial mapping, we aim to better understand the multiple ways in which port city regions and their institutions operate. Um, and to do that, we need shared perspectives on port city regions and shared skill and time levels to map these regions. Uh, the maps you show on the slide, the maps of the region of London, Hamburg and Rotterdam, uh, they are still in a very primitive state, but already show um, that by using the same skill and time levels and data layers, although they are very basic, they allow us to compare the port city regions and their spatial development through time. Um, and then as we look at the legends, I don't know if you can really read them, um, but then it becomes clear that we also need shared definitions and terms. Uh, what is, for example, the definition of built-up area? Where does the port area begins uh, and the built-up area of the city stops? What do we mean with a mixed-use port? What, uh, what is a reclaimed port? Um, and beside these categories of land use, the maps also show infrastructure. And for the maps from 1900 to 2020, also shows political boundaries. Um, but for mapping maritime mindset, we need much more data layers than it ma this, these maps are showing. Um, we need a kind of form of deep mapping. Um, and Vincent will explain more about uh, this mapping methodology. Yes, um, I'll take over from here. Um, so this idea of a shared approach to um, spatial analysis and uh, mapping has already been taken up as a key issue in other uh, research initiatives as well, uh, most notably um, that of the European Time Machine, um, which I hope uh, most of you already heard about before. Um, this European Time Machine initiative has already sparked various um, local uh, time machine uh, research projects um, in the meantime, um, such as one in Amsterdam that has been um, started recently, um, and so the Amsterdam Time Machine of which um, one image related to this um, project is depicted in the slide here. So basically the time machine idea or the, um, the conceptual, the concept behind it is that 
um, there's sort of, um, um, some sort of a Google Earth is created uh, for um, the past, the Google Earth of the past, let's say, in which um, um, uh, links are being made to various types of cultural her heritage and um, vast amounts of digitized archival sources in one uh, shared geospatial framework so that um, various um, researchers with different research projects can work um, within a shared framework um, for um, yeah, in order to also like uh, come up with scalable um, research purposes, especially in the field of urban history. Then, um, for instance, uh, a particular researcher might researcher might want to um, uh, investigate um, an issue related to um, an entire city, um, like Amsterdam as a whole, whereas another person would be more interested in a specific neighborhoods. But um, in a shared framework like the one um, come up in the Time Machine Initiative, they can do so in. Um, uh, um, in sort of um, uh, yeah, a shared way, let's say. And the image here is um, from uh, an art historical project related to the Amsterdam Time Machine um, uh, made by Wex Xuan Li. And it's basically about the general idea that's depicted in this image that um, if you start, if various researchers start with the same GIS uh, system, they can build it up together uh, by adding various layers that um, are related to their different uh, research perspectives. So. Um, one person might uh, want to focus on street patterns that existed in um, a city like Amsterdam in the past, whereas some person would bring in archival sources, which can then also potentially be mapped on these street patterns on the basis of the locations that are mentioned in these archival sources. And then another person would uh, maybe add another layer of um, uh, networks of people uh, involved um, in um, interactions that happened in Amsterdam in the past and um, representations of the city and of its inhabitants can also be linked uh, to all of that in one um, entire framework. And this is also how we, um, in our discussion among the five of us, um, see uh, or envision how we can bring our um, projects together. We made this very well, basic um, pie chart idea that um, all five of us have a different um, topic um, but we all touch on uh, the idea of a maritime mindset and mapping this um, in uh, in some way or another. So, for instance, while Ivona might be uh, is most interested in the port city region as a, a bigger um, well, um, uh, escape uh, or a spatial um, uh, domain, um, Thomas might be more interested in uh, mostly interested in the particular um, places in this region that pertain to commodity chains and commodity flows that uh, run through um, the port city networks all around the world. And maybe uh, with my PhD connected to the Pleasurescapes project, I might be more interested in um, the um, uh, pleasure districts where sailors would go to when they had some time off of their work um, in the ships. And on the other hand, there's Hilde, whose PhD um, focuses mostly on um, networks of business entrepreneurs in port cities and the norms and values that they try to um, instill in um, certain projects that they try to build in port cities. And uh, on the other hand, Tian Shen, again, focuses on something else entirely, um, the UNESCO uh, heritage listings, which, uh, which comes up with certain um, uh, names and um, typologies to categorize um, uh, cultural heritage related to port cities. So all of us um, take a different uh, perspective, but uh, we come together in the middle um, when we talk about mapping maritime mindsets. Um, we all have one part of the maritime mindsets puzzle. And since maritime mindset is a very intangible thing, we all have to work together in order to see how we can um, make the step from this intangible, um, very uh, vague ID maybe, to make it more concrete and put it on uh, a map. And I think now from here, Thomas will take over to um, talk a bit more about a more um, concrete example. Uh, yes, uh, so like uh, Vincent uh, uh, ended with the, the intangible versus the tangible. And as already uh, we've discussed so far is that with this merit and mindset as being intangible and maybe a little bit vague, we have many ideas, many associations, many uh, concrete examples of what this might be. Uh, but it is, as we agree upon implicitly, also not something which is simply out there or which is there to, for us to find or which is confined to one theme. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be together in this group with multiple disciplines, multiple backgrounds, focuses, multiple research questions. So we, we think that merit and mindset, if it is, exists, is 
transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, or multidisciplinary, and that it is a complex phenomenon. And that uh, relates to our mapping, because you might wonder why would we like to map anyway? So that is maybe because although it's quite multidisciplinary and very uh, thematically um, broad, they have one thing in common, and that is maybe they share a space. So in that sense, as uh, Vincent also mentioned, uh, the layers can help us to combine those, um, those different perspectives and approaches to something which is on a higher level, a maritime mindset. And uh, you might wonder why you see these maps of uh, Syria. That's uh, why, uh, that's because I uh, most, uh, in, in several occasions, explained to people that if you want to understand the uh, Sir Syrian civil war, you're not going to understand it uh, if you only recognize that things are happening at the same time, but you also have to understand that they share a same space. So the political, geopolitical, uh, soil, climate change, oil reserves, ethnicity, religion, they all are necessary for this complex phenomenon to be understood without them or only from a time perspective or, or only from a um, thematic perspective, you're not going to uh, grasp the, the full meaning of the conflict. So uh, returning to maritime mindsets, um, I've been reading uh, a lot of this on a more uh, abstract and uh, philosophical level. And one of the, one of the many characteris characteristics of this mindset that is mentioned is that these, um, and this is related to the publication I mentioned before about hydro politics. We discussed it with Sabine uh, intensively. So I'm just going to take one example of this, these characteristics, which is uh, maritime mindset or maritime communities. They are much more tolerable and much more uh, equal. So if you want to map that, I was thinking, how, how could you grasp that to something you can pinpoint on the map? And I came up with the idea that, uh, for example, you could um, hypo hypothesize that the uh, maritime areas have more different uh, places of worship. So on the left, you see a Rotterdam area with several sea, uh, seamen, seamen uh, churches that are from different nationalities. So you might think, well, that's, that's an, an, uh, that proves my point of or the hypothesis that it's uh, more tolerable in those cities. But then if you think more uh, of it, and you can look at a, a second um, picture, a second map, which is Istanbul, and you see a lot of uh, different uh, places of worship from diff very different religions. And then you have to rethink uh, your, your conclusions or rethink even your evidence. Like, okay, is this truly because it's a maritime mindset? Or is it because it's on the, the border of many different empires over time? And then again, does it mean that there are many artifacts of these places of worship? Does it mean it's tolerance or is there many uh, strife and many conflicts going on? So this is to illustrate, we have this merit and mindset concept, all of us, all our, uh, we all share or have different themes and perspectives, but operationalizing it to the map, it's, it's quite challenging. And um, therefore, um, there, to, to do it in a correct way, we have to uh, think together. And this is where our presentation uh, obviously has its role, to think of a shared uh, language, but also the framework of what, what we could map. Um, when is it mapped enough? Because in the end, everything can be related to everything, also spatially. So we have to find the right level of uh, mapping. There are other examples that of projects that have been um, mapping things with criteria that I found a bit arbitrary, like uh, if something is paid with or built with money that has been made out of, then it's mapped. So I would really, uh, urge us to think specifically and, uh, and think uh, related to the theme. Um, um, and the last point. So, so that's uh, the, my last point, maybe that um, we also have to think about uh, 
thinking from a research question that is uh, is answered at some point while mapping. So th that was my point. Yeah, so um, while Thomas uh, talked about, uh, we, we have to think about a research question. I had my research question way before we started talking about mapping. Um, <laughs> my my uh, research is about the, as, as Vincent already said, about the business networks that were um, uh, in, in power in Rotterdam, the port city of Rotterdam, uh, uh, between the 1930s and 1970s. Uh, and my, I argue that they constructed a narrative um, of the world port city, um, uh, uh, integrated city with a port authority that was also established in the 1930s that actively uh, strategized and marketed the, the world port city as a unity. Um, and they reinforced this narrative uh, during the reconstruction after the bombings of uh, 14th of May uh, 1940. Um, and uh, ways in which they did this was obviously uh, with architecture and urban planning, uh, which there has been written a lot about, but I argue that it was also more of a cultural effort um, uh, with education programs in the most broad sense of the words within the companies, but also uh, in the city, um, um, but also cultural manifestations, uh, tourism, uh, uh, hotels uh, in order for, for business people to stay and see the city and stay a bit longer. Um, so this this was already quite in place when I when I started talking about mapping and and I actually I panicked a bit when I when I heard uh, Yvonne and Vincent talk about mapping and 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 Q Q Gist and and whatever things there are. But actually, when we started discussing this and and uh, they explained it very well that. That it can be as simple and as, as as complicated as you can make it and actually what Yvonne said in the beginning made me uh, realize that there are a lot of um, blind spots that you have to deal with uh, in your research when you start mapping and even in the first hour that Yvonne and I talked there was so so much that I thought oh wow this 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 thing gives, gives, is, is really a tool for me to to bring this project a bit further so I was thinking about one of the examples of my work, uh, which is the window on the river. And as you can see um, on the left, there is a map from Rotterdam in the, from the city center of Rotterdam, uh, approximately 1930. Uh, you see in the bottom left corner, the uh, GK van Hogedorp square uh, with the old Bijenkorf uh, department store building um, by the architect of Dudok, which is also built in the 1930s. As you can see, it's a very cozy um, kind of uh, uh, end of 19th century square. Um, and it is, you, if you can see the green circle and the, the green arrow is, is the call signal uh, pointing to uh, the, the biker building. Uh, so this square was largely demolished in the bombings of uh, 14th of May, of which we commemorated yesterday, uh, coincidentally. Um, but um, as you might know, there was a really swift uh, reconstruction after the 1940s. A lot of plans were immediately being made and the business elite was also very much involved in this. And um, one of, one of the, the entrepreneurs had a really uh, civic vision for the post-war city, uh, being, be, being a city of families, uh, giving the dock workers also good, um, good ground to work from a healthy, um, healthy environment that didn't um, uh, lead them into drinking or abusing their wives. And one of the, his ideals was a stroll, for example, on Sunday along the River Mass. And his ideal was, for example, uh, a um, Brittany seaport town, like uh, the example here in Nantes. Um, and with a lot of ships coming by, truly an urban spectacle. And he wanted this to be seen from the coal single, so the main artery of the city, the, the, yellow, the green arrow on the left. And mm. as you can, uh, Yvonne, can you go one side further? As you can see, here is the map of 1953 and this idea of the opening up 
the call signal to the river, the window in the river was actually realized. However, this was just for a, few, a short time. So it is a, it is a paper vision, but also a, a, a paper vision that came to being. But after this, uh, 1953, water regulations were very strict, also um, um, relating to the, the disaster that happened in 1953, the large uh, floodings of, of the south of the Netherlands. Uh, and the dikes were uh, heightened. So the, the dike that you're looking at with the, um, um, they were heightened. So the window and the river actually didn't exist anymore. So what we are, and, and now this is the place where the Maritime Museum is built. So this is, when you look at the maps, uh, you don't see any of this, this kind of story. So I'm also looking for ways of, of bringing uh, this story into the maps somehow. And this layered thing, this layered time machine example that Vincent showed actually gives us a great way of, of in, um, inserting these networks that I was talking about, their values about the civic society that they aimed for, the, um, the norms that they, um, that they thought of for the dock workers. So there is, there is a lot of story um, uh, just in this uh, small piece of mapping. And what's so interesting uh, for also the words that we are using is, is the references they're giving to the, to the sea life of, for example, Brittany, um, the, the strolling along the port, the window on the river, uh, these maritime, these, I mean, uh, uh, Thomas was talking about the, the kind of gray area, but this is, I think, one of the examples in which the maritime mindset can be very purely um, experienced. So, Chan Chan, maybe you can take over to go to the yes. Uh So, uh, first of all, thanks to everyone who helped us fill out the questionnaire. And we have received 25 responses until last night. And since most of you have already filled the form, uh, going through all the items on the list, you may have figured out that there is a logic behind this list of poor city mindset that items can be categorized into port harbor facilities, port uh, for land and port hinterland. And of course they can be categorized in other logics, but we see this categorization very uh, straightforward. And as a result shows, the most frequently selected items are located in the category of port harbor facilities. So the port infrastructure, including the wharves, docks, jetties, quays, uh, and mooring facilities, etc. Uh, it has been selected 21 times. And second comes the ships, including the cruise ship, oil tankers, um, container ships, etc. And it's been selected 16 times. And then still in the same category, uh, warehouses, bridges, and lighthouses are also selected over 10 times. Then it comes to the category of port foreland. Uh, and within this group, urban waterfront is most emphasized, selected 16 times, and followed by the cruise ship facilities, for instance, the cruise terminals, um, and then the shipyards uh, and port hinterland infrastructure, which run all the way from the hinterland to the port, uh, including the roads, rail, and pipelines. Uh, it may be a bit arbitrary to put the hinterland for infrastructure in this group, so and um, as it can be seen as a connection link in the hinterland, foreland, and the port. Uh, but I will just leave it here for now. Um, and for the category of port hinterland, uh, the distribution of selection is more um, evenly. Uh, as you can see, the monuments related to the sea or port has been selected 13 times, historical waterfront uh, crafts and workers' housing and headquarters of related business are also frequently selected but uh, have not exceeded 10 times. So if you look at the left side of the slide and these stickers are the items added by our interviewees, for instance the ocean and cleanup, reuse uh, and uh, re recycling facilities, maritime transport, green energy, uh, scales to weigh, also the trucks and parking areas are deemed to be missing in the current category of port harbor facilities. And in the port foreland category, uh, people have added the nautical sports, um, public place where people can feed the seagulls, uh, and leisure facilities with a connection to the maritime port. Uh, and port communities, uh, and also the um, evolution of port institutional and governance setup 
were added to the for Tinterland category. And it's also very interesting to see that some items are never selected. For instance, uh, the, por uh, the post office in the port area, and some are selected for only once. For instance, the dump sites, the housing facility on ports, and the vestiges of the slave trading control and abolition. Um, yeah, and for the water-related mindset, Kifong, can you? Yeah, please, thank you. Uh, for the water-related mindset, we have proposed a category of water for services, waterscapes, water energy, waterways, and ritual life or representation of water. And also river ports, uh, water disaster and rebuilding, and a water museum cannot really be placed in the above mentioned five groups, but uh, still vitally important as part of the water-related uh, mindset. And the most frequently selected items are within the category of waterways, that are the sea, the canal, the river, and then in waterscapes, the protection against floods, uh, the wetland are also selected many times. The dam, Uralay, from which we generate the hydroelectricity uh, within the group of water energy, was selected 15 times. Uh, the representation of water in artworks has been selected 11 times. And the series of missing items were added as shown on the left, um, circular water management, rainproof city and combating water pollution were added as part of the water for services. Uh, the beach and beach culture was added in waterscapes, uh, although I think it can be covered by water recreation, uh, maybe. And a botanic garden with artificial drizzle was also added in this group as a very um, specific type. The salt pan formed by the evaporation of lake or pond in the desert was added in waterways. And then also the wildlife and flora was also added, uh, which also makes much sense because they live on the water. And I think it should stay somewhere at the bottom as a separate category. And again, some items were never selected, including the seasonal water storage uh, and uh, hydro pneumatic devices. So to propose this typology is Corolla uh, mentioned earlier, we have screened all the relevant UNESCO World Heritage and some national heritage to make sure the typology of port city and waterscape mindsets are really inclusive and balanced. And we have also understood more about the importance of words, uh, terminology, as well as taxonomy, uh, the way in which we conceptualize things really matters for uh, what we do. And this is definitely true in the heritage field. For instance, to make connections between similar types of port-related and water-related structures around the world. And we need to use the same word. So we think uh, this list of items can be identified as a representation of uh, a word city or a port city or waterscape network to show us how a port city is actually functioning in historical periods and also uh, contemporaneously. Uh, which could also be a good starting point for mapping uh, maritime mindsets. And meanwhile, this network can be seen as a semantic checklist to evaluate uh, what kind of uh, heritage port city, uh, which, which kind of heritage in, in the port city or uh, uh, in the wordscape is being preserved and what is not, but should be. And based on the frequency of selection in the questionnaire, we can find out uh, in the field of port cityscape, uh, which kind of heritage is most emphasized and which is less focused. For instance, according to the results, uh, the port infrastructure, urban waterfronts and ships have drawn uh, much attention, but the dump sites, contemporary migration centers, health facilities on port are still seeking more um, recognition as part of the network. Uh, 